Hi, my name is John Cullen. I'm one of the pastors here at Southbridge. Thank you so much for checking out our sermons online. Our prayer is that you are challenged by the Word of God and grow in your affections for Christ. We recognize that this can be a great supplement to your personal study, or maybe you simply could not make it to church this week. Our hope, though, is that you're plugged into a local community of faith. So if you live in the Raleigh-Durham area and looking for a church, we would love to meet you on a Sunday and help you get connected. If you are not local, we want to encourage you to find a gospel-centered church in your area. Thank you again for letting us be a part of your week. Enjoy the Word of God proclaimed. You're in a series called uh, Risking It All, which sounds a little scary, right? And a, and a little frightening and, and maybe even not all that intelligent uh, to risk it all. My mind goes to poker. I don't know if your mind goes to poker. That's maybe, maybe I need to confess that. But my mind goes to all in, you know, that we're, we're going to push all the chips in. But, but Hebrews 11 is where you've been. And uh, no doubt, the most famous character in all of those listed in this hall of faith and hall of fame in Hebrews 11 is Abraham, right? Father Abraham has many sons. You are one of them, and so am I, right? So let's just all praise the Lord. Abraham is the most famous. In fact, uh, it's hard to overestimate the significance Abraham has had on world civilization and and world history. Uh, Think through this. Three major faiths, which account for more than half of the world's population, all look to Abraham as their faith father, right? And and, and so it's hard to overestimate the impact that this character in in Hebrews 11 has had on our world. And all throughout his life, uh, God is testing him over and over and over again to find out what it is that's really in him. In fact, most of the guys listed and and women listed in Hebrews chapter 11 uh, are given one verse. And you say, well, that's not very much. It's more than most, right? In in fact, the majority of the faith heroes don't get a verse in in the canon or in scripture. But uh, some of these guys got one verse, which is actually a lot when you think about how many, you know, we could give a verse to in the history of the world and the history of faith. But Abraham gets five verses. And then God uh, begins to talk in general about the whole list again. And he goes back to Abraham and gives Abraham a whole nother three verses. So Abraham has eight verses and he's uh, a character that we ought to study and we ought to pay attention to. In fact, let's jump to Hebrews 11 if we could springboard off of one verse, verse 17 in Hebrews 11. And it says, it was by faith, say faith. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac. That's the story we're going to talk about. You know that story, and uh, there's a lot of lesson in that story. As a sacrifice when God was testing him. Underline or circle those words in your Bible, testing him, testing him. And uh, I don't know what your personality is with tests. I have four children and they all have different personalities as it relates to tests and how you test. And I have one that made a 36 on the ACT and one that made uh, about 20 points less than that on on the ACT. And and some of them are are, uh, competent test takers and some of them are not. Quite honestly, the one who's the least competent test taker has the best personality uh, uh, of all four. Uh, of, of our children, but, but some of us love tests, some of us hate tests, some of us thrive with tests, some of us get nervous with tests. And I don't know if you've heard the story about, uh, in fact, I think this story came out of this whole Raleigh area, one of these colleges and universities here in, in your area, that this sophomore in college sweated all semester over this notoriously difficult exam in his ornithology class. Ornithology, you know, is the study of birds. And, and, and in this class, he, he is studying all semester, stressed over the final that everybody knows is going to be very, very difficult. And, and he gets to the uh, end of the semester and, and had stayed up night after night for multiple nights in a row studying all night long for this test. He was distressed and dismayed and quite honestly ticked off when, when he walked into the final and he realized that the final he had been preparing for uh, was not going to be multiple choice questions like he thought, was not going to be essay questions about birds like he thought, but, but that the test was 25 questions, the whole test, 25 questions. And there were 25 slides presented on the screen at the front of the room of birds, not of birds in all of their magnificent color, but just the feet of the birds. 25 species. And the whole final was to name the 25 birds by their feet. He was furious. And in protest, he got up to walk out of the, out of the classroom. And the professor saw him walking out and said, young man, if you walk out of this final, you will fail the course. And he said, fine, fail me. And, and he said, okay, you fail. What is your name, young man? And, and the student turned and lifted up his pants legs and said, I don't know, professor, you tell me what, what my name is, right? And, and the, the whole thought of that is that test, 
no one likes an unfair one, right? We all want it to be fair. We want it to accurately reflect what we uh, know. And, and when you think about Abraham and you think about these tests, here's a question that you ought to ask. Inquiring minds w- would ask this question when you study this character in Scripture. It is, why didn't God immediately give Abraham this miracle child? Why didn't God immediately whisk Abraham away to this promised land? The moment Abraham trusted God, placed his faith in God, why didn't God give him that child and take him to the promised land? Instead, he made him wait 25 to 30 years for this promised child, leading him down this wandering and winding uh, path filled with dangers and heartbreaks and, and setbacks. Why? And this is so important. To the context of Scripture, it's because God was not just trying to take Abraham somewhere. He was trying to make Abraham someone. And he was not just doing something through him. He wanted to do something in him. And listen to me today, church. What God is doing in you is just as important, if not more important, than what God wants to do through you. And and when you read the scripture, you understand that he doesn't want to just take us to heaven. He wants to put heaven in us. In in Genesis 22 is where we find this story. It's where we find this test in Abraham. If you got your Bible, turn to uh, Genesis 22 at the beginning uh, of the Bible. And when we get to Genesis 22, okay, we find Abraham in another test. In fact, this is the greatest test that that Abraham ever faces. And and, and by the way, we, we know it's a test, We just read it in verse 17 of Hebrews 11. The Scripture tells us, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in the canonized Scripture, it says it was a test. So we don't have to wonder what was going on here. It was a test. God was testing him. But you have to keep in mind in Genesis 22, Abraham did not know it was a test right? And and so he's walking into it, not understanding what you and I understand, looking back on it, that that it's a test. In fact, the old King James Version says that God tempted Abraham. That's a terrible translation, English translation uh, of the Hebrew word there. Uh, God doesn't tempt, right? We know that according to James. God does not tempt. God tests, and, and it's very different. In fact, the Hebrew word there is better translated, not tempted, but prove. And the word picture is like a, a furniture builder who builds a beautiful, sturdy piece of furniture and then pushes on it to see what's there. And to test, <coughs> excuse me, can somebody get me a water? To test it in such a way that, that we have to prove this table, right? And so that's what the builder is doing in this scenario, God being the builder of your faith. Look at this church. We're coming from both sides. <coughs> Thank you. He's going to test it. The enemy, your enemy and my enemy, tempts us to cause us to fail or, or, or succeed, to, to, to trip us up, right? He, he tempts us. But God tests us to prove what it is that is actually in us and, and to bring out the best in us. Now, Genesis 22, we get to this place 22 chapters into the Bible, and Abraham has already had this miracle baby right? And his name, they name him Isaac, which there's humor in that in the Hebrew. When you understand the Hebrew, there's a whole lot of humor in it. Isaac means son of laughter. The whole thing's hilarious to them. And it's not lost on them. They understand how hilarious it is. Abraham and Sarah are basically both a hundred years old when this baby is born. And they think that's funny. In fact, when you play that out in your mind, the fact that they're a hundred years old when this baby is introduced into the family means that all three of them, Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac on their first birthday got diapers uh, for, for their birthday. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding, right? But, but, but let's just jump in the text. Let's read it together. Verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. There's the word. Underline it in your Bible. Tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and Abraham replies, here am I. Now, just so you know, here am I in the Hebrew is not the equivalent in the English of hello. It's bigger than that. It's here I am. I, I'm ready for your command. It's almost a military term. It's a term of surrender. God, here here am I. I'm ready for whatever you would command. And if I'm honest and vulnerable with you, I I find that reaction to God from Abraham a bit remarkable. But because up until this point, 21 chapters in, every time God has come to Abraham, he's asked him to leave something good or something beautiful or to do something and attempt something impossible. I would be like, oh, no, God. 
God's calling again, right? And Abraham says, here am I, I I'm ready. And, and, and by the way, you would think for Abraham that Isaac's birth would be the pinnacle of his faith journey, right? That, that this would be the highest point in his whole faith journey. And from that point forward, it's just free sailing, right? Like he got on an escalator in his walk with God, but, but it's actually just the beginning of his walk with God. There's more to come. And, and you and I who know the story, we, we, from our perspective, we know on the backside of this test that's coming is the greatest blessing the world will ever know. We, we know that, but Abraham doesn't know that. And, and you need to know, God is not testing you to see if you will fail or succeed. God is testing you because he wants to bless you. That's what he wants for you. And that's what he wants for his children. He wants to bless you. And Abraham says, here, I'm, here am I because he trusts God. And by the way, that's the difference between a life of drudgery and, and a life that is filled with joy is learning to trust Jesus. That's the difference. That, that hymn we were singing a moment ago about uh, trusting Jesus. You, you, know, you know, the chorus uh, to, to that song is, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, say it with me, thus saith the Lord." just to know in your heart, this is what the Lord says. Listen to me, you show me a happy Christian and I'm gonna show you one who has learned to trust Jesus. You, you, you show me a struggling Christian and, and I'll show you one who is yet to learn how good God is and yet to learn how committed to us God actually is. Let, let, let's keep reading, verse two. Then God said, take your son, your only son, say only, whom you love, say love. Isaac, say Isaac. God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Now, you know the mountains of Moriah or Jerusalem. That, that's, that's Jerusalem. The Temple Mount today is on Mount Moriah. And that's where he is taking him. And look at what he says. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. I wish I had time to describe all the kinds of offerings to you today, but I don't have time to teach that today. But this is a burnt offering, which means he's not only going to ask God uh, to cut the throat of his, I mean, uh, ask Abraham to cut the throat of his son, but now he's going to ask him to burn him up into ashes. It's a burnt offering on the mountain that I will show you. So God said, Abraham, take your son. And scholars, Hebrew scholars say what happens in the text right here is that it dramatically and suddenly slows down. In the poetic language, it slows down is, is what's taking place here. In fact, the pace slams to a crawl because what God is saying here is so unbelievable that it reverberates through Abraham's soul. And, and the Hebrew word for son is ben, and it's found 10 times in this text. And there's something happening. And God said, Abraham, I want you to take your son. Pause. Abraham had two sons, remember? Your only son, pause. Uh-oh, there's only one left in the camp at this point. The son that you love, pause. That's Isaac. That's Isaac. You see, this child represented everything to Abraham. He is the child of promise. What, what they had left everything for, all of their hopes, all of their dreams, all of their affections centered on this child. And God says, take your son, your only son, the one that you love, Isaac, and I want you to offer him up to me as a burnt offering. Are you kidding me? I, Isaac is the one that made life worth living for them. And, and here's the question you ought to ponder. Uh, in addition to the question that Adam asked earlier is who is Jesus to you and who do you say Jesus is? Here's a question for you to ponder today in the series of risking it all. What would it be that God would ask of you that you would begin to at that point go, not that God. No, and you would begin pushing back to God. We see in the text for Abraham, it goes all the way to Isaac and he's not pushing back. I just honestly, I think for me, it would be something as simple as a car. 
or a checking account or a, you know, a 403B or a 401K or something, something just simple. But, but, but for Abraham, it, it's Isaac, the son of promise, and, he, and he's not even pushing back. Look at verse 3. Early the next morning, I think that day I would have slept in. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two, son, two, or two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. In the Hebrew, by the way, in this one verse of Scripture, there's six verbs, which means that this is a process. It's like a checklist that is happening. It's gone into slow motion, like, like when your parents would say, get down here. Right, you're going the long way. On your way. Look at what it says, verse 4. On the third day, again, it means he took the long road, right? It's not three days journey. On the third day, he took the long road. I don't know if in Raleigh you guys like country music like we do in Oklahoma, but, but, but there's a, a, a Rodney Atkins song, right? Makes me want to take the long road. Makes me want to take the back road, right? You know, we're going to put a little gravel in our travel. I, that, that's what I would do in, in this story. But, but on the third day, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. By the way, Star this in your Bible because this is the place where the concept of the third day is entered into the story of Scripture. And you and I know that's messianic. We we know this is about Jesus, right? On the third day. Uh, You've heard that phrase in Scripture before, right? Over and over and over again. And and on this mountain, by the way, on this very mountain, 1,800 years later, Jesus would be sacrificed for our sin. Now, let's keep reading. Verse 5. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We, circle that in your Bible, will worship, and then we, circle that in your Bible, will come back to you. It's interesting that he chose the words, the word we. We. Abraham was convinced that somehow they were both coming back. Why? Because God had made a promise. And God had a promise to fulfill, and Abraham didn't know how it would work out. He didn't know how God would keep it, but he was certain that God would keep it. He was probably recounting the promises of God in that encounter in Genesis 15 that just happened seven chapters earlier when God uh, kept both sides of the covenant. You you know, in the Hebrew, uh, the, the verb for covenant is cut. We're gonna cut a covenant. You don't make a covenant in Hebrew culture. You cut a covenant. And what they would do is take an animal and and they would cut it down the spine and they would lay the two halves and create a path in the rock. And the blood is pooling in this path, in this crevice in the rock. And then the two parties uh, would walk. By the way, these two halves of these two animals is where we get the tradition in weddings today of separating the sanctuary between the groom's party and the wife's party, the bride's party. I've never found a bride yet to this day who will allow us to do this in in, in this ceremony. But it would be biblical. And and, and both parties barefoot walk through this pool of blood with their bare feet, leaving prints of blood on, on the rock after they walk out of that pool. And what they would do at that point is they would turn and look back at these two halves of these animal, and they would basically say, if I don't keep my end of the bargain, may what happened to this animal happen to me? I think it would cut down on the divorce rate if we would put this in wedding ceremonies. And that covenant with Abraham, Genesis 15, you know that God showed up and the smoke and the fire passed through. God went through first. Why? Because in a covenant, the greater party always goes first. And God is the greater party. And so he passed through. And and then what he told Abraham, by the way, is that I'm going to give you descendants, as many as there are stars in the sky, as many as there are grains of sand on the planet. I'm going to give you descendants and nations, and the whole world is going to bless your name. That's what I'm going to give you. In exchange, what I want from you, Abraham, is perfection. And so when Abraham, I don't know what he was thinking in that moment where the, the, the calling on his life was perfection and yet he's going to walk through. He begins to put his foot in that blood and God sticks his finger in Abraham's chest and says, no, you can't do it. And he passes out and the fire and the smoke pass through again. And then God was saying, I'm going to keep both sides of this covenant. It's not going to be on you, Abraham. Perfection, not even possible in you, right? That's not what God would call us to either, right? Because it's not possible, but he's going to do it. He's going to do that 
that in us and through us. That's what God does. He keeps both sides of the covenant. In fact, Abraham keeping his part of the covenant to, you know, birth nations and, and descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, he's 100 years old. An IV of Viagra would have not enabled him to populate the whole world. Think through this for a moment, that God is keeping both sides of the promise, and God is so concerned about this that 400 years after Abraham, he's like, I want you to know this. I want you to see this. I want this to be a part of the daily ritual. Now I want you to commemorate that covenant every single day of the year. At 9 a.m. you do it. At 3 p.m. you do it. Every day. In the rain, in the rain, you get wet. On Shabbat, on Shabbat, of course, especially on Shabbat. During the festivals, of course, during the festivals. Every day, I want you to do this at 9 a.m. and 3. By the way, it's amazing when you read scripture, how many things appear at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. in the afternoon. You remember Elijah calling fire down from heaven? Happened at 3 p.m. You remember Jesus being put on the cross? 9 a.m. Jesus died on the cross at 3 p.m. And God is setting a story. Why? It's one story. It's one story. It's one story, and all of history is his story, and he's setting the stage, and this little drama and this little play is playing out on the mountain where 1,800 years later, Jesus would find himself on the cross, and at nine and three, you do this every single day, multiple priests involved in this whole thing. One of the priests is the timekeeper, and he's watching the sundial, and he's going to notify another priest who's got a shofar up on the pinnacle of the Temple Mount, and he's going to blow the shofar a second that it hits that moment, 9 a.m. or 3 p.m. And then another priest is going to take a knife, and is going to cut the throat of the animal, and the blood will be spilled at that very moment. And when they hear that, here it comes, and it gets to that moment, it's 3 and he's shouting the, blow, the, the shofar over the town. And all the believers who hear that shofar in that moment, they stop what they're doing in that moment, and they believe for a moment. And, and they're saying, God, would you please keep your promise? Listen to me. Don't misunderstand in Scripture all of those times where those animals were killed. It was never for the forgiveness of sin. The Bible tells us it's impossible for the blood of a bull or a goat to forgive the sins of people. It was all about them declaring back to God, God, would you keep your promise? Would you keep your promise? And Abraham, in the dark, is walking for three days in this journey, and he's wondering, what are you going to do, God? But he's recounting the very promise of God. God, you promised. You promised. By the way, Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham believed that he was going to kill Isaac and that somehow God would raise Isaac from the dead. That's what Abraham believed. Now, we read the story with the end in mind because we, we, we know the end. We know what happens. So all along in the story, we're looking for the ripcord. In fact, we do that because we've read these stories. We do it in our own faith walk. God asks us to risk something. God asks us to give something. And we're always looking for the ripcord. Listen, what drove Abraham up that mountain was not the strength of his character. He was not walking up that mountain the whole time saying, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. No, 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 no. He was going up that mountain the whole time saying, God is faithful. All your promises are yes and amen. The only thing that can drive you onward as a husband, as a father, as a mother, as a wife, through difficult times, through tragedy, through financial hardship, through sickness, it's not the strength of your character. It's an unwavering conviction in the goodness of God and an unwavering conviction in the promises of God. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife, and the two of them went on together. By the way, kudos to Isaac here. He's carrying the wood. Now think through that for a moment. If he's big enough and strong enough to carry the wood, he can evade a 100-year-old man. Most scholars think he's at least 15 years old. That ruins the plays and books we read as children, doesn't it? We think of him as a baby or a small toddler. He's at least 15 years old. He's carrying the wood to the offering, which means at some point he's not being wrestled onto that altar by his 100-year-old dad. He he is laying himself on the altar. Here's a question that you ought to ponder. If you're a parent, would your kid do that? (laughs) 
He'd heard about his daddy's faith. He'd experienced his daddy's faith. He'd seen his daddy not only say it, but live it. And his daddy's faith caught fire in his heart. And he laid himself on the altar. Look at verse 7. He didn't do it, by the way, without any questions. He does ask a question. Look what he says in verse 7. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Do you know what that means? Isaac had seen this before. He understood what was playing out. He knew the story. He knew the recital. All of these things, by the way, are mikvah. The, mikvah is the Hebrew word for re recital. It's a rehearsal. This is all a recital and all a rehearsal for the real thing that is going to come one day. Verse 8, Abraham answered, God himself, you ought to underline those words, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Now we know what Abraham has been doing for three days, right? In, in, in the dark and in the silence, he's been reminding himself of the the promises of God. And by the way, this was not just a command to kill Isaac. If that were the case, he could have just stabbed him in the tent and, you know, avoided all of the gyrations and charade and preparation and all that went with it. It was bigger than a command just to kill uh, Isaac. This was about the firstborn. And, and they knew that. That's a much deeper subject in the Old Testament. That, that offering the firstborn in the Old Testament signified the debt that every man owed to God, that every family owed to God. Throughout the Old Testament, God laid claim to, to the firstborn because it represents our very lives. That's the reason that when the death angel came, remember with Moses, that, that it was all about the firstborn. Why? He'd already claimed the firstborn. In Hebrew sacrificial system, God demanded the firstborn calf, the firstborn sheep, the firstborn goat. He also demanded the first of all the harvest, right? The first fruits. In, in other words, the life of the firstborn was forfeit. There was only one way that you could spare the life of a, of a firstborn. There was some sort of redeeming sacrifice had to be made. God was showing this is a debt that every family has to him. That's why Abraham and Isaac understood what was happening here. T Tim Keller writes of this story, and he, he says that ha had Abraham thought that he heard God say, I want you to kill Sarah, and then I will know that you love me. He, would, he wouldn't have done it. He, he would have assumed he was hallucinating because God would never have asked him to kill Sarah. That would have been murder. And God would never ask for senseless murder. But, but, but in this story, this is about firstborn. This is not about murder. This is a concept that has already been set up in Scripture. And they understood that, and they knew what was playing out. They knew exactly what it meant. Firstborn represented the, his very life and the debt that he owes God. Look, look, look at verse 9. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there, which, by the way, men, just write that down. You're supposed to build an altar in your house. I, I, I'm so sick to death in this culture of men declaring, I'm the man, you're going to honor me, you're going to respect me, I'm the man. Look, get a job, man, and we'll respect you, and we'll honor you. Take care of your family, and we'll respect you, and we'll honor you. Put an altar in your home and teach your family to worship Jesus and worship God who, who is alive, and we will honor you. Abraham built an altar in, 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 this, stereo, in this scenario, and, and he took care of his home, and they arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on an altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Remember, that's not hello. That's I stand ready for, for your command, God. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son, Isaac. And, and with the knife susp uh, suspended in midair, Abraham proved himself. And he passed the test and he showed there was nothing he would not entrust to God. There was nowhere he would not go with God. Look, look at verse 13. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over. By the way, the fact that it was caught by its horns means that its body was unblemished. An unblemished lamb. He took it and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. 
And it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. What you name a place in Hebrew is extremely important because it commemorates what, what happened there. Last week, Dave told you about Gideon. Remember, he said, and they called it Jehovah Shalom, which means the peace of God. In, in, in this place, they called it the Lord will provide. Isn't it interesting that they didn't call this place Abraham obeyed? It's interesting. But there was something far more significant on display than Abraham's impressive obedience. And what was being demonstrated is God's commitment to us and his commitment to keep his word, his commitment to keep his promises. Remember, Mount Moriah is right outside of Jerusalem. And scholars say this is the very place, Calvary, where Jesus was crucified. By, by the way, it's not just the same mountain where Abraham and Isaac took place. It's not just the very same spot and very same moment where David, remember, he bought the threshing floor uh, that, that for a place of worship. The exact same place. Why? It's one mountain. It's one place where all of this is playing out. All of this was recital for the real story that was coming in the person of Jesus. In other words, hundreds, 1,800 years before Jesus would die on a cross, on that very rock, this whole story with Abraham and Isaac is playing out. And, and it's as if Abraham is playing the part of God and Isaac is playing the part of Jesus up until a moment, right? Uh, up until the moment where the lamb is, is caught in the thorn bushes. And more than 1,800 years later on this very same mountain, it would play out for real. But this time there would be no substitute lamb provided because Jesus is the substitute unblemished lamb. And he would willingly lay on that altar because of that, we could know the Father loves us. And the Father keeps his promises that he would not withhold his son, his only son, the one he loves from us. And this story is not first and foremost about Abraham's commitment to God. It's about God's commitment to Abraham. That's why they called it the Lord will provide and not Abraham obeyed. And about 1,800 years later, it's the Passover. And about 2 million Jews have gathered on Mount Moriah in, in Jerusalem. And on that Friday afternoon, it's five minutes till three. They're getting ready for the sacrifice to happen. They're getting ready for that moment to happen on the Passover, one of the greatest feasts, if not the greatest feast of all the feasts. And that priest, that timekeeper is watching that sundial as it gets you know, four till, three till, two till, one till, three o'clock. And, and then they get to that moment and he gives the signal and the priest on the top, bye -bye! is blowing the shofar and everyone in the town stops to remember God keep your promises and on that Friday in a stone quarry just a couple of hundred meters away are three crosses and on those three crosses the guy in the middle looks like he is dead and in that moment when that shofar blows he lifts his head and he screams it is finished because God keeps his promises. The very promise he had made 1,800 years earlier, he was saying in that moment, I am faithful, that is my name, and I will keep all of my promises. When you get to the end of your life, as we sang a moment ago, bless the Lord, oh my soul. All that is with me. By the way, Hebrew scholars think that what David was doing in that moment and that psalm was his spirit was rising up and telling his soul what to do. His soul is his mind, his will, and his emotions. But the spirit man, the part where the Holy Spirit indwells you, was stepping up and saying, I don't care if you're reserved. I don't care if you're tired. I don't care if you're not into it. We're going to worship the Lord. And he was telling his soul what to do. Oh, my soul, we are going to worship the Lord because he is worthy. I, I don't know where the application lies for you today, but I want you to hear God is faithful. 
He keeps his promises. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and open your hearts today? In our first service, we, we saw nine or ten people, I think many of which who were church people, come into the kingdom and come into the faith family. And I believe that this hour will probably be no different. And so those of you who are believers, you're already praying, you're already asking God to do what only God can do, and that's save people. I can't save anybody, Pastor Scott can't save anybody, this church can't save anybody, but Jesus not only can, he's willing to save men and women and boys and girls today under the sound of my voice. I, I, I want to ask you today, do you have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ? You may say, well, I, I walked an aisle at one point in my life. That, that's not the question I asked. Do you have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ? You say, well, I, I filled out a card. It's not the question. Does he walk with you and does he talk with you? I was baptized, again, not the question. Do you have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ? And could I ask you all across the room with nobody looking, the, the reason we have nobody looking is because the last thing I wanna do in this moment is embarrass anyone. We're so glad you came, but I, I, I wanna, Make sure you know where you're going. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Alex, I know for sure that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. He's my forgiver. He walks with me. He talks with me. He's the Lord of my life. Would you raise your hand all across the room and let me see it? Thank you. You can put it down. Lots and lots and lots of hands. Lots of hands. In fact, I would say vast majority of hands. You can put them down. Every time I ask that question in a room like this and that many hands go up, there, there's something that just my heart jumps and skips a beat because what that means is that a man who died 2,000 years ago is still changing lives today. How, how could a dead man do that? He's not dead. He's alive. He beat death, hell, and the grave, and he's alive. A dead man can't save anybody, but an alive man not only can, is saving people in this room and all over this world today. Some of you couldn't raise your hand, and I, I want to thank you for being honest. I don't want to embarrass you or point you out, but I would love to pray for you. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Alex, I, I don't know that Jesus is my Lord or my Savior or my forgiver. I don't think he walks with me or talks with me. I, if he comes back tomorrow, I don't, I'm not certain he's coming for me. But I would like to know, would you pray for me? If that's you, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. Pray for me. I, I, I don't know that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, okay? A anybody else? Just raise your hand and let me see it, okay? Anybody else? Would you just raise your hand? If you're going to pray, include me in that prayer. Okay? Anybody else? I'm seeing a couple hands. Any, anybody else? Pray for me. You say, well, I, I've been to church a long time. Again, that's not the question. Last time I'm going to ask, do you want to be included in that prayer? Anybody else? Just raise your hand. Say, pray for me. Include me. Okay. If you're a believer, you're already praying. Father, I pray right now for those who are saying that they need assurance of salvation. They need an intimate relationship with your son, Jesus. I pray today would be the day of salvation, that it would spring up out of the ground today, and that you would save men and women and boys and girls. And what I would like to do is lead you in a prayer. And you say, well, I prayed the prayer, and, I, and I, don't, I don't know if I have any assurance. Look, I'm not banking my salvation on a prayer I don't find anywhere in Scripture. I'm, bank, I'm banking my salvation on the fact that I have a living, breathing relationship with a living, breathing God. It's an intimate relationship. But I do think that the prayer properly prayed and it reflecting your will actually invites Jesus to step out of heaven and step into your life and to be the Lord of your life. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, not just Lord of the world, but your Lord, Lord of your life, you, you, you shall be saved. I want to help you do those two things, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And so I'll pray it one phrase at a time so that you can pray it after me. I don't want you just to repeat it. I, I want you to pray it. I want you to talk to God in heaven. 
And because I want to encourage those who are about to pray this prayer and mean it with all of their hearts, I'm, I'm going to ask those of you who are already believers to also pray it out loud as an encouragement to those who are praying this for the first time or praying it for the first time for real so that no one will, will pray alone. But if you want to cross that faith line and trust Jesus to be the Lord of your life, would you pray with me and say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, but today I ask you to forgive me for all of my sin. Jesus, come into my life to be my Lord. You call the shots in my life as my Savior, my forgiver, in the best way that I know how. I turn my back on my sin, and I trust you alone, Jesus, to save me. Thank you for saving me. I receive you, and I receive salvation. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, you're trusting Jesus to be the Lord of your life, the Savior and forgiver of your life. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and let me see it all across the room and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. I, I, I meant it. Several hands, several hands going up. You can put them down. I, I, I want to say to you, congratulations. Congratulations. I, I don't know what the other applications are for you today. In fact, if you prayed that prayer today at the, at the end of the service, the, the staff will be here across the front and you, you, you just walk up and take one of them by the hand. You say, I, I don't know what to say. All you have to say is I prayed the prayer. In fact, as the service ends, if you say, I'm not an extrovert at all, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I could even do that, you just stay seated. Just linger in your chair. Somebody will come and check on you and talk to you. That's all you have to do is just stay seated. But for others of you, there, there, there are other applications more than just salvation. When we talk about risking it all, that's about faith. And God wants to grow our faith. In fact, it was this very text last fall in our church, I was studying this very text. And through this text, God called me to another level of generosity. In fact, what I felt the Lord say to me in that season last fall was I want you to look at the most generous year you've ever had in terms of your tithes and offerings. And I want you to triple it for the next two years. It was a risk. And God was calling me. And there were moments where I'm asking the question, is it possible to outgive God? Because I think I'm about to. And then God told me to share with my church what he had asked our family to do. I'm not really for that. But I did it. And God took that commitment that God called our family to and he did something so miraculous in our church that I did, I, it would take me three Sundays to tell you about it. And you got to hear me today, church. Listen, when God asks you to give him something that's in your hands, it is not because he's in need of what's in your hand. It's because he wants your fingers to turn loose so that your hands are now in a position to receive what he wants to put in your hand. He's not testing you for you to fail or succeed. He's testing you so he can bless you. The only reason he takes something out of our hands on this side is so that our hands are now open to receive something greater and bigger and more God-sized so that we could walk with it for a while, steward it for a while, and then trust him with that. And, and then watch and see what he does with that. that. That's the path he's calling us to. And, and today I hope that, that you will take some steps today in saying, God, what is it you're asking of me? What is it you want from me? I, my answer is yes. Any time, any place, any cost for the sake of the gospel, I will risk it because it's, there's no risk involved when it's this, for the sake of the gospel. And so as we get ready to worship, would you just ask the Lord what he's saying to you today? If you prayed that prayer, would you either stay seated or find a staff member afterwards? And, and, and let's watch the kingdom advance today. Father, today, would you do in us, your kids, all you want? And may our answer be yes, yes, Lord. Here, here am I. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we all say amen. Would you Thank you for joining our sermons online. We hope to see you in person soon. Our location and service times can be found at our website, sfchurch.com. If God has stirred your heart today and you'd like someone to pray with, or if you'd like more information about Jesus, 
please take a moment and email us at info at sfchurch.com. Thank you again. God bless.